you know, you heard it from or, or read about it or, or you know, the, the, nothing's worse than losing a child of your own. Um, but to experience it is uh, all those cliches that you hear about, they, they have a whole different meaning uh, than when you're living it. Um, and when you say living it, you actually relive it over and over and over and over. Um, well, to this day, you know, I relive it. It's it just you handle it differently and you cope with it differently because you learn, you learn how to handle it differently. You try to make a positive out of the situation or, or the story to try to, um, well, just to, to put your head down and keep moving through. Usually, you know, I have other kids in our family, so I, you know, there, there's no other choice in my mind but to get through it. Um, but, and then everybody handles that trauma differently. That's the biggest thing that I've had to learn. Everybody handles it differently. Um. When my son died in 2012, when the cause was fentanyl, um, the reaction that I got, including myself, at, you know, when we found out the cause of death is, what is fentanyl, and, you know, and, and, and now today, fentanyl is a very common word. I'm not saying everybody knows what it is or the dangers of it, but they've heard the word fentanyl, uh, and they know, it's, you know, they know what it is to a certain extent. So it's changed drastically. My son's story is, I would like to think it's, it's a little bit more unique, but yet it's the same story. Just the great kid. I mean, the coaches loved him. The teachers loved him. People in our community loved him. He was a great son. He was a very disciplined, good kid. So he had, he had wisdom teeth removed. Okay, so this is how it starts. Wisdom teeth um, gets his first Script from the doctor, hydrocodone. Very familiar, very common painkiller prescribed. And uh, he took a liking to him. And I never, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. Hey, I ran out of, I ran out of pain pills and my, my, my teeth killing me. Well, you know, what am I gonna do? You know, I can relate to some, some tooth, you know, pain and that's that's a whole different level of pain. I don't want my son to be hurting, so I'm like, yeah, I'll make a phone call so we get it renewed. I'm worried about marijuana, I'm worried about drinking and little did I know um, he took a liking to the pain pills and that's, that's where it started. Uh, like I was mentioning the coaches, he's a three-sport athlete. All my kids are three-sport athletes. Um, playing football, he tore, tore his bottom lip on his senior year, I believe, his senior year or junior year, he tore his bottom lip away from the gum line. And he played the game, but after that, we went to emergency room and they reattached his lip to his gum line. So guess what? Another, another script, pain pills. Again, had no clue of, you know, of the situation at all. Pairing-wise, there's, there's, I mean, I oh, it'd be stupid for me to say I wouldn't change anything because obviously I would because there was something happening behind my back that I wasn't aware of. But just to kind of give you an idea of my parenting, is I, I, I knew where my kids were. Any time, if it's 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock in, in, in the morning, if you ask me where my, where are your kids at, I had an answer. And I didn't have an answer. I would make sure they were there. I would get in my vehicle and randomly drive by and make sure that they weren't just, their vehicles were there, but they were actually there. I mean, I would do the, the things like, hey, where are you at? Well, I'm at such and such house. Okay, well, go outside and take a picture of the mailbox. Send it to me right now. I'm like, Dad, are you serious? I'm like, yes, sir, bud. You know, just, you don't trust me? And it's like, no, I don't trust, it's not that I don't trust you, just just do it. And, and you know, and, and very cooperative. Um, when my kids come home, whatever time of the night, before they just go upstairs and go to bed, come in here and talk to me. Talk to old dad. I want you to have some interaction, you know? 
I want to talk with you. What do you do? I want to smell. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to make sure things are, things are right. And, you know, I wasn't educated at that time. You know, you can't smell prescription pills. You can't, they can get good at, at covering it up. You know, everybody gets a cold. Everybody has allergies. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I definitely wasn't, I would definitely wasn't educated um, on that. But, so that's how this all started was with, uh, with the legal prescription pain pills to hydrocodone. And hydrocodone was his, was his drug of choice. That's what he liked. He got football offers to go to college and he got baseball offers as well. So um, decided to, to pursue college baseball of course, going to the colleges with a pain pill liking, it was around every corner, anybody and everybody. Um, not to scare parents, but it's, it is what it is. I mean, you either need to make sure they're educated and informed or they're going to get educated and informed by somebody else. Uh, and you just hope that it's the right information. But when Jordan got to the, the college, um, trying to compete and, you know, for a position and, and whatnot, he developed an arm problem. His arm was hurting him. Um, little did I know, he was, he was medicating to try to get through practices. And then it got so bad, um, it basically, when he tried to throw the ball from the outfield, he just couldn't hide it anymore. So we finally went and got him an appointment with the orthopedic to, to, to have it checked out, and uh, he had torn his labrum. So it's a full slap tear, uh, that just a full tear on the labrum. So we did corrective surgery there. So guess what, more, more pain pills, more pain pills. Um, did not, again, did not have any clue that there was a problem there. His best friends in high school even told me, he said that, you know, that Jordan, when they did their party and Jordan didn't party with his pills. This wasn't a party thing. His best friend didn't even know he had a pill problem. He would drink a couple beers with, uh, with everybody else and, and, and that would be it. But Jordan was medicating and going to sleep. Jordan was medicating to, to keep from going into withdrawals. Now I look back, oh, I remember him being sick. I remember him um, talking about being constipated. He was talking about having problems sleeping at night, you know, I was just like, I, those, were, those were all signs of him withdrawing and trying, trying to stop. And I missed those, you know, he just got the flu or he's, you know, um, and he wasn't faking it, I could tell he was sick, you know, but it, it, there's no doubt in my mind it was, it was withdrawals from him trying to, trying to stop, trying to quit. I remember the day he came to me after that surgery on his arm to, to fix it. Um, said he wanted to basically stop going to college, stop baseball, stop it all. You know, of course, I go into the coach mode. I was like, well, you know, son, I know it's hard on you mentally, um, but, you know, I'm going to be there to support you. You know, you can do this. And he said, no, nah, there's other things too, Dad. I need to tell you about something. I said, okay, and he says, um, I, I've got a pill problem. I, I, I'm hooked on pills. And i just like, what? And again, I'm a solutions guy. I'm like, okay, well, we'll fix it. You know, we'll fix it. Well, you know. But he was, he was determined that he was done with playing ball and done with, with college. Um, and I, I don't regret that. I mean, if you're not going to go to call, you know, you're not going to go to the class and put your, you know, that's just not something you talk somebody into. So, so so be it. So we came back and tried to stay in school, but the grades weren't there. So I wasn't going to waste the time and the money. Again, you can't force these kids to go to class. It's an absolute waste of money. So I was just like, well, if you're going to do that, then you need to pay for your college. Um, so he ends up getting a job. Very reliable, very good worker. Again, there's this, this kid's a good kid. Um, so 
you keep in mind there's no legal stuff hanging over him to make him go to a rehabilitation or whatever. We were calling. He was trying to go to meetings. He was going to meetings. He was finding them on the Internet. Back in 2012, there was, there was a lot of churches around that had posted, posted NA meetings, and he would find these, these posts on the Internet, not Facebook, on the Internet. And he would show up, and he'd be like, Dad, they stopped doing these meetings a month ago. You know, they never took the, the meeting down, you know, on the Internet. So he was going, he was, and that was him. He was trying to find help. Um, we would call, or I would call, or his mom would call professional type services, and he wasn't, he wasn't bad enough to get put in anything or, or go anywhere. We were testing him. So, I mean, I'd get on the phone, or like, you need to do this. I said, I'm doing that. And they, well, what about this? I said, I'm doing that. And we'd go through the whole thing, and they're like, oh, you're doing everything that you should be doing. All the way down to his paycheck. He would give me his paycheck at work. I mean, we were doing everything we could. But he wanted help, so we, we went, and uh, I won't name the organization, but it's a great organization, and we paid the money and got them all set up. And uh, he had to be talked into going, which is the red flag. Again, no legal or courts or judge hanging over top of him to make him go and make him stay. So uh, we paid and we made all the arrangements and he checked in there and I remember him calling me the next day and said, I don't belong here, Dad. There are people in here that do this drug and do that and he goes, I don't belong here. And he left. He walked out of there. And I said, if you walk out of there, you know, they're, they're, you know this, this, and this, trying to get him to stay. And he walked right out of there one day, one day. Um, so through, through that situation, you know, it, it started that cycle. You know, you're going to come home, you need to buy by our rules, you know, and we're testing him. Um, and by the way, if you're going to test somebody, you got to know what you're testing, how long it stays in the system. If you're testing once a week, if you're testing every other week, you're really just wasting your time. So I tested every three days. Every three days. Um, other than that, it gets out of the system within three days. So I was testing him every three days, and he would be clean for a month to a month and a half at a time. And then he would, get, he would be dirty. So he wasn't bad enough to go. It, it was frustrating. He wasn't bad enough to be accepted into any kind of rehabilitation center. So, so this was just that cycle, and it kept. He started stealing, you know. He started uh, feeding his addiction in different ways. Um, got a job, very reliable. Showed up every single time. Um, did very well at his job. Made a matter of fact, one of the managers <laughs> caught him on the forklift. He said, he said. Uh, you're doing a heck of a job because I, something just tells me you don't belong on this forklift. And that was a, that was a guy just spotting somebody that is meant and for a higher purpose. That here's this kid on this forklift doing a great job, but you don't belong on this forklift. Um, so Jordan found a, a a program called Celebrate Recovery in Joplin, Missouri, a faith-based program. Uh, of course, the 12 steps. Uh, and he asked me to go with him to the meeting and the best thing I did was say yes I'll make arrangements I will go with you to that meeting my son was quiet kind of you know like I said being an athlete competitor but he wasn't a talker okay but I went to this meeting with him and I watched my son lead the meeting talk in front of the group, mention his faith, and it amazed me. It was like, this is, this is awesome. This is great. The color in my son's face came back. His personality was back. That dark cloud that just kind of hung over him a little bit went away. And I was just like, praise God, this is awesome. Again, still testing him. He was clean for three months. Three months, absolutely clean. Um, 
like I said, I've coached all my kids, so I coached him, and then I was coaching his middle, his son, um, his brother below him, at the time, and we were um, in the Kansas City area uh, at the state tournament in the summertime, and I coached. Um, and while we were up there at this tournament, I don't know, Jordan knew we were going to be away. Um, Jordan was having a, a time of weakness, but he reached out on his cell phone to a contact. And uh, his cell phone showed that he was asking for his hydrocodone, which blows my mind that that his contact didn't have hydrocodone because it's such a such a I mean it's everywhere. Um, but the text messages show that he didn't have hydrocodone, but he had this patch. And Jordan said, "I, I never used that before." And you know, the, uh, basically, this individual started kind of taking a consultative approach and like, "Oh, you know, this it's great. You'll love it." You know, so they met halfway, and for whatever amount of money, 40, 50 bucks, he sold my son a patch instead of the hydrocodone. Went home, and I, you know, doing some research on the patch, the fentanyl patch, of course. Um, I guess they come in 25, 50 mic, and then 75 mic and 100 mic patches or whatever, but uh, Jordan being clean for three months, his tolerances were extremely low, zero. Uh, he put the patch on his shoulder and went to sleep. Went to sleep in our bed because he liked to jump in our bed when we were out of town. So he put the patch on and he went to bed and uh, he never woke up. Um, we were out of town and since he was such a reliable individual, he didn't show up to work. So his work was calling. And uh, so my wife at the time reached out to her her brother who lived in town and went to, told him told him to go by the house and George's car was there and said uh, he's probably in there sleeping she said well go in there and wake him up and he's like well, I'm not gonna go in there and wake him up you know if he partied too hard or did something stupid last night then he you know she said no you go in there and you wake him up tell him tell him his mama said get his butt up you know so um, his uncle went in there and. Unfortunately, I had to find him in, in our bed, and I hate that. Uh, I hate that for his uncle to, to be the one to do that. But so, yeah, that, that was really tough to get that phone call and, and drive to you know two and a half hours home. Um, yeah, his brother. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I just took it all in. His brother made a decision to stay up there because we were making it, we had made it to the championship game, and it wasn't a game thing. It was a it was a Jordan would want you to Jordan would want you to stay here and finish this tournament. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to bring or change the situation. So uh, my son Colton decided to stay and, and play. And uh, obviously, I took the family home, uh, making sure my wife was taken care of, and drove drove home immediately. Um, Colton's a good ball player too, um, and I, it, it'd be wrong for me not to share the story. But it, so all my kids are, are have been really good athletes. Um, so Colton stayed to play. Colton's a senior year, um, all through. Little league and all through high school career, he's never hit a home run. He's, we're just not home run hitters, okay? Um, so everybody in our town was up there, and, and they knew what had happened. They, you know, the people were talking about it. Well, this kid right here, this number 12 on the Baxter Springs team, I guess he just uh, found out his older brother passed away, and he's staying here and he's playing. And one of our players, my, my son was a leadoff batter, and the number two hitter said, said, uh, we'll go up there and hit a home run for Jordan. So the kids, you know, he's leadoff batter, so we're not home run hitters, like I said. But he digs in, and he takes a cut at the ball. And I guess, uh, I guess uh, our second, uh, our uh, number two batter, told Colton said that didn't look like that didn't look like a home run swing, you know. So Colton digs in a little bit, takes a cut, and hits this ball, and it's like a movie. I'm, I, 
everybody was telling me about it because I wasn't there. Obviously, I'm driving, I'm driving my family home. But this baseball hits the top of the fence, hits the top of the fence and bounces over. The first home run that Colton's ever hit in his life. And he rounded the bases, everybody standing up, cheering, including the, 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 our opponents. And uh, I got the picture of Colton holding this baseball up, hitting that baseball, you know, him crying. Uh, hit that baseball for his brother. Yeah, so that just breaks my heart because it affects everybody, you know, and everybody has to handle this stuff differently. So when we get home, you know, my whole family's in, at the end of our house as we pull in, and, um, you know, it's horrible, horrible drive. I've always wanted to help other people. Um, I would like to think that people in my community would, would say that. I mean, I've got hours and hundreds and maybe thousands of hours working with other, ki other people's kids on the ball fields. And um, I continued to coach the rest of the kids out. But, you know, on top of that, it was slowing down a little bit because my kids were getting older, and as they got to the high school program, I did coach. I did coach high school uh, summer ball, um, but I did replace some of that extra time with um, with uh, volunteer law enforcement. So um, I am a volunteer deputy for my county, and Jordan was a big motivation behind that. And I wanted to I wanted to put myself in a situation where maybe I can I don't know tell Jordan's story to somebody while they're cuffed up in the back of a vehicle or, or if I see him out and about. And it's definitely opened that. I've had tons of opportunities to talk about it. I've had a lot of people in cuffs while they're cuffed up tell me, hey, I'm sorry about your son, because we're, we live in a small community. Um, I participate in some of the uh, you know, I, I guess some would call it a drug raid. You know, I do participate in some of that. You know, I, I, I don't hesitate to help take people to jail because I think that it's an opportunity for them to change their life. You know, yes, you can get drugs while you're in jail, but, you know, uh, at least you're being supervised. And it's also give opportunity to, uh, you know, the younger the better. I mean, I hate to say it. I don't, I mean, saying the younger the better for an addict, but the younger and having a situation where they can be uh, incarcerated. I'm not saying that's the best application for everybody, but um, I don't feel bad about it because I know it's just an opportunity that doesn't work on everybody, but if it works on one, I mean, that's the mentality you have. If you can just save that one, if Jordan's story can just save that one, then you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be happy. He's gonna be happy. Um, and I know my son's story has saved many people because I have already had that people come up to me. And that's another reason why I'm here today is I want to continue because it's been 2012 and I want to make sure that I keep talking about my son, keeping his story alive. Because my son, being the type of, from the outside looking at this kid, he clean cut, he's strong. Physically, like I said, the coaches loved him. He he actually was a uh, a mentor, a a a a good role model in our community for our kids. Now, how can I say that a, a good role model when we're talking about an addict? Nobody knew about his situation. He volunteered so much of his time, and he the kids loved him, and he loved the kids. Um, his addiction was a very private thing. So I can still say that. He was a great role model. Um, and uh, because of that, that, we used, him and his mom and I were very transparent from day one. We're going like, you know what? We're, yes, it was embarrassing for our family. Um, but the big picture is it can happen to anybody. The big picture is maybe his story can save somebody. That's the big picture. So we are absolutely transparent about why Jordan passed away. 
So with that, um, we worked with law enforcement, and there were some gray area on some on some laws dealing with these types of transactions with, you know, unlawful illegal transactions of drugs. And it basically, not get into details, but it's basically the accountability for the individual selling uh, was almost the person or the individual abusing almost had to die on site right after the transaction for that individual to even be held truly accountable. So that obviously needs to be cleared up. This is a shared responsibility and accountability. Now I can't speak for other people, but as far as our story goes, we were upset with Jordan. We were mad at Jordan. We were angry with Jordan with his decisions. But there is some shared accountability for the individual who decided to sell and make 40 bucks to sell some patch and, t and talk somebody into taking it. Yes, he voluntarily put it on his body. That's why there's a shared accountability there. So this law, um, this House Bill uh, 2044, was, uh, was passed, um, and it basically cleared that gray area up. Just basically, if there's those illegal transactions that, that result in severe bodily harm or death, that those individuals, let's say the drug dealer, is, that, that, that individual could be held accountable and tried for a first-degree murder. So I realized my son's story is a little bit different than the majority of them in 2023 and 2024. But Jordan was used on some billboards and, and he's on a poster in our school right now. We're a baseball school. Uh, Baxter Springs is known for their baseball. Jordan has two state rings, two state championship rings, which is a big deal. What does a what does an attic look like? And, and and you know what? When you see when you see pictures of Jordan and uh, the other pictures that I've seen, I hope that's what people are seeing right now. Is that we're not talking about meth or crack? You know that where there are some very significant things that are happening. When you actually are able to physically see the pill addiction, they're deep in the addiction. Okay, and, and, and it, it's, it, is, it is quite the task to take that person out of that addiction and lead them out of that. Um, the answer, the best answer is to get them before they're an addict, you know, and that starts at the school. Um, I, that's what my desire has been is, is educating them before they're an addict. How do you do that? How do you keep their attention? Uh, so I, I've done some. I want to do more. I want to. I want to have those roles, and, and and I don't know if it's just to make me try to make me feel better about a, a coping mechanism. But I, I want to keep telling my son's story. As a parent, you start obviously going to question yourself on the things that you did and, and didn't do, things you said and shouldn't have said, or may have should have said. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that cycle, uh, we talk about this all the time, the cycle of losing somebody, not just the addiction, but just the losing somebody, you know, you, the, the, it's, just so, it's just so real. Um, the denial and the anger, you know, uh, being, being mad, being mad at Jordan for his decisions, you know, um, it's all real, very real.